my 12th year at the university. It's also my 40th year as a bilingual educator, because I started teaching in Basel in 1976 as one of the first bilingual teachers in Texas. I'm very proud of that. Um, and so um, our topic, I called it Language Wars, because in many ways I have been fighting a good fight for bilingual education for 40 years. Um, it amazed me when I first came to Texas that there were people who were against bilingual education. Uh, I had grown up in South America, and uh, I was, my parents were very proud that I was bilingual, and that all my sisters and everything else, and it was considered a very good thing where I grew up in a very bilingual community, um, but things were different here. Um, so anyway, I call it, and still today, there's a lot of controversy. Um, I think that a lot of people that are against bilingual education are just misinformed or uninformed. And so um, I think that the way to work with them is uh, not to scream and shout, stop my foot, but rather to educate them. So uh, hopefully we will do that tonight. I have a wonderful panel of some of my students. These are students who are working on master's degrees in curriculum instruction with a bilingual specialization. They are experienced, currently practicing uh, bilingual teachers. Um, and, and I have uh, Liz there on the end is working on her doctorate. Uh, she's also a uh, secretary. Is it Nada Thabe? Yes. She's, she's an officer, and she's on the Thabe board, the Texas Association of Bilingual Education. And I think she's as passionate about advocacy for bilingual as I am, which is why I love her. And I, I, I give her A's because she does good work, but I always give her. <laughs> so anyway, uh, they will each get a chance to give you a little more information about them. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, we'll be doing some of the informational stuff. So next slide, Hoi. Um, OK, so first, a little discussion about by the way, we'll give you a, 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 copy, a copy of the slides after this is over, but we've got to have a little pop quiz, and the answers are on the slide, the paper slide, so we don't want to, you know, you're not going to cheat, right? <laughs> so, um, the benefits of bilingualism. First of all, let me see, a uh, show of hands. How many of you in the, in the audience are bilingual? big issue. 
issue in our, our schools today, really too big an issue. If we can only help our school administrators to understand that if they will foster their students' bilingualism instead of trying to eliminate it, they will probably end up in the long run with better scores and then they get little, sometimes they get little paychecks even for that. Or at least they don't get fired. Um, <laughs> When we understand another language, that helps us understand other peoples. Because our language in our languages and our cultures are very well tied. There's things that you can say in, in Spanish that you can't say in English because that concept, that object does not exist, and vice versa. Uh, so um, empathy and language. Oh, job marketability. Well, I know in our own field teaching, there's a very high demand for bilingual teachers. And I, as I tell the undergraduates, if you can just get that bilingual teaching certificate, you don't have to worry about uh, getting a job. You have to worry about which of four or five job offers that you're going to be given do you want to accept. And I try to tell them, you know, look for the, look for the school, the school district with a good bilingual program, because that'll make you um, that's true for other fields. Certainly in all the human services, if you're a nurse, doctor, a social worker, you're a, a salesman, uh, knowing other languages helps you uh, get jobs because clients speak other languages. In fact, one study showed that um, being bilingual, uh, even if it was not that you didn't, the, the company or whatever didn't have any clients in that, but they still appreciated that when they were looking at their clients. Um, and then access to social networks, because today you can get online and you can be communicating with people all over the world, um, and uh, you can communicate with them in their language, uh, just as you can when you travel. I myself am a gamer. I like to play online games, and I've gotten a lot of fun uh, Latin Americans from all over the U.S. and all over Latin America in Spanish, and occasionally I meet some French speakers and use that as well. So um, that's that's part of it. Two other things are mentioned here. They have shown through their brain scans that bilingual people, their neurons, and those are the things that make our brains work, are denser. Maybe that's why we're um, another very important thing, especially when you get to be old like me, is there's a lot of evidence to show that uh, there's often delays. Not that you're never going to get Alzheimer's or dementia or whatever, but maybe it'll hit you later in life and it won't hit you as hard. So I, I like that thought. That that's one reason I keep practicing my Spanish. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, go ahead. You see there that first little link there. If you on that. Here's why being bilingual is the absolute coolest. We have a little short little thing there that he's going to hopefully pull up. That's the right link, so we just have to be patient. Okay, scroll down and, and let's look. There's a bunch of why. to enjoy some of the most beautiful expressions that the English language totally misses out on. And I don't know if we have audio or not, when I tried this particular link, that's a uh, Sophia. In my country, there's a saying that means love is just around the corner. And I was curious as to what that Spanish saying is. Anybody know? Love is just around the corner. Uh, el amor está a la vuelta de la 
Ted. Okay, so go on down. You sound cultured and worldly for speaking another language. See ya. Oh, oh, he went all the way to the dance. He wanted the dancing girls. Yeah, he wanted to get the. I had to make it going. These little little bounce pads on your laptops are, are awkward. Okay, your master switching between languages mid sentence like it's no big deal. Deal. I went to the store to buy my zapatos that I like, but it was gone. <laughs> in school, you can take it uh, for a language for an easy A. Go on. This is Harry Potter. You can always tutor people in your language to make some e extra cash on the side. I wish I did at the bottom video because I'm sure a lot of it's funny. Studying abroad was a total breeze for you. And the locals absolutely love that you can keep up in their native tongue. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. I found that to be true whenever I've traveled. Uh, what's that? Okay, you have a valuable resume skill that, that's way cooler than Microsoft Office. <laughs> you guys are like really spot smart now. You don't even know. And you have more job opportunities thanks to your linguistic skill.
And see if you can tell us what's numbers two, three, four, five, because I'm going to give you a heads up and tell you that number one is... Which one do you think is number one, two, three? 
not totally accurate, but <laughs> there are something like 24 Spanish-speaking nations in the world. Okay, now a little, uh, next slide please, what? A little now going more into um, students who are in bilingual in the SL programs, English language learners who want to call these Back when I started teaching, it was limited English proficient students, LEP or LEP. And a lot of us didn't care for that term. It sounded like you're limping around or something. <laughs> limited, it's a very negative kind of feel. Uh, so uh, and, uh, nowadays, more people are calling them English learners or English language learners. Uh, increasingly, now there's a new term that is emerging bilinguals that I kind of like better. Uh, but they're all the same one. They're, they're people whose first language is not English and have not yet acquired enough English so that they can function well in American schools. So um, this is a nice little map. And you see the dark blue states? Six states have over 100,000 ELLs. And this was in, you know, 14 years ago. And so does Puerto Rico, which we could have guessed, right? Well, can you name the, let's see, your geography. Can you, just, can you look at that map and tell me what the six states are? The dark blue ones? Arizona, correct. California. Texas. California. Illinois, Florida, New York. Illinois, New York, and Texas. We're number two, by the way. Number one is California. They have a, approximately twice as many ELOs. Um, another thing that I think is very interesting, not only are there a lot of these students, like this, everybody knows that Hispanics are a fast, the fastest growing uh, minority in the United States today. Uh, that's also true of their children. As a matter of fact, to a great degree, that growth rate is, um, is fueled by their children because the majority of immigrants that come to our country or a childbearing age. They're not old people that are retired or anything. They're usually in their 20s, 30s. And those people have more kids than older people. Um, so it's the number of those students nearly doubled in the US in that 10 year period from 2002 to 2012. I mean, 92 to 2002. That's a pretty dramatic uh, growth rate. Um, Pup is number three. Let's talk now about EOLs in Texas. And now you've got four questions. And you've got to have to pick uh, multiple choice, just like your standardized test. Are y'all are real good at that, I'm sure. <laughs> and you decide whether the answer is A, B, C, or D for all four questions. And then we'll see. Ready to make a stab at it? Okay, question number one. The total number of ELLs in Texas, did you, uh, let's see how many guessed A. Raise your hand if you guessed A for that. B? C. C is correct. Um, during the lab, we talked about 
C-75. Okay. It's uh, about 80%, actually. Number three, the percentage of English language learners in bilingual programs, because not all of them are in bilingual programs. Significant numbers are on ESL programs. As a matter of fact, in Texas, we have bilingual programs just at the elementary level, by law. And uh, once you get to high school, well, middle school, sixth grade typically, then they go into ESL programs. There are little or no bilingual programs at the secondary level. Uh, so what percentage, uh, no, I'm sorry, this is, I'm saying it wrong. Bilingual or ESL, of all the students in Texas, what percent? You know that one million? Is it closer to 12%, 18%, or 25%? Who said uh, 12%? That that represents 12%? Who said uh, 18%? Who guessed 18? And who guessed 25? Correct answer is 18. And usually I've been following for several years now, and it stays about that. So we're not really making a big dent in our percentage, but just in our, our numbers keep rising because the numbers of students in general in Texas keep rising. We're growing state. Uh, number four, the percentage of EOLs who speak Spanish is, who said 50%? Who said 70%? Who said 90%? Uh, Over 90%. Yes, 
said, I, I, I will address that, some of that research uh, later on. Okay, uh, a few, couple more slides and then we'll get to the good stuff, which is talking to the, 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 the ladies in the front line. Um, next slide there. Okay, just a quick graphic. Just as uh, I said that the growth rate for ELLs is nationally is much, many times more than the most the rest of the students, a, a, a similar pattern in Texas, as you can see from that graph, because the red line is the ELLs. And then finally, a little bit uh, about the many languages. As we said, that over 90% of uh, students in bilingual and ESL programs in Texas are Spanish speakers, but there are hundreds, well, somewhere between 100 and 200, I think, languages represented in Texas. We are a very diverse state. And um, that's, those are the top languages there. Um, number one is Spanish, and then uh, that's followed by Vietnamese is number two. In fact, uh, there are Vietnamese bilingual uh, schools in, in Dallas, in the Dallas, I think it's um, Garland has them, and maybe Dallas ISD. Yes. Um, Chinese is, up there with 1% as is Urdu. And if you're like me, you probably don't have never even heard of Urdu, but it's a, 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 a language of the Mideast, right? am I right? I think so. We have a lot of those here. And then there's also uh, the other kind of Chinese, Mandarin, two kinds of Chinese, uh, Arabic is up there, uh, Korean, uh, Khmer, which is uh, a, uh, a language of uh, Southeastern Asia, like Vietnam and Cambodia, Thailand, Lao, Laotian, uh, German, and other. Notice that German and Spanish are the only two European languages on that list. The rest of them are mostly Asian languages, not only Asian languages, right? Okay, so now, next slide. Um, let's start with you, Liz, and the first question. Briefly introduce yourself, tell us who you are, how many years you've taught, and the current teaching. Actually, you're out of the classroom. Yeah. Uh, so my name is Liz Gaspar Garcia, and um, I taught in the classroom for seven years. I taught second, third, fourth, and fifth. Uh, loved every minute of it, um, and just found that when I was looking at curriculum, I could make a better impact, trying really hard to help it align better for our ELO. Uh, but a really nice person told me, no one's gonna listen to you until you have some pretty little initials after your name. Thanks, babe. So, uh, decided to go back for uh, the doctorate. Um, currently, I am an instructional coach at a wonderful campus in Dallas ISD. I would change it for anything in the world right now. So, um, but that's what I'm currently doing, and I love it. Thank you, Liz. Next, Maria. Yes. Uh, my name is Maria Garza, and I've been teaching uh, mostly adult education uh, since 1980. So I've had a lot of years uh, dealing with ESL parents. And uh, recently, when I came from Dallas to Commerce, uh, for the last four years, I've been uh, working with children who are bilingual and whose homework becomes very difficult for them. And the school was not understanding as to why. And so that's where I came in as a volunteer first. And um, to me, my greatest uh, um, enjoyment is that once I see or I can identify the problem, why they're not getting it, and I'll ask them about the, the uh, words and and if they understand something or they don't understand it, they say they understand it, but then when they get to it, they don't. And so I'll explain it to them in Spanish or more or less in their own language, and then they get it. And so that's my my um, my enjoyment, that uh, once I, I do that, that I can speak to them in the language that they can understand, then they get it. And I mean, they're, they're successful. My name is Imelda Carrasco, and I have taught for seven years. I had a baby about six months ago, so I'm not teaching. 
a beautiful music when you hear them to read. Even the student who is a little behind, he reads. And it's, uh, you can, when you go uh, at the end of, that, of the day and you go to bed, you are, you sleep very well thinking they are reading and you are doing your work. It's the most beautiful feeling. American Bank in New York City, which was the American branch of Banque Nationale de Paris, which was the fourth largest bank in the world, but I hated banking. It was so boring. <laughs> yeah, that's not boring when you teach. Never boring. 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 Never So that 
that's when I got into the adult education because I wanted to help other people. And once I got out of high school, I began to uh, teach uh, at the churches. And from there on, it just kind of it was ingrained in me, I guess. It just, everywhere I went, I wanted to teach adults. Everywhere I, uh, whatever church I went to, I, you know, they, we set up a program. And so when I came here again, um, I met this lady from the church as well, and um, she said, why don't you apply at the CISD? We, we have this program that we're going to start, and so it became another part of teaching adults. Um, uh, after that, I was invited to, uh, to work with kids uh, because I wanted to you know, make a difference. Just, just as people have been in my life, I wanted to make a difference for them as well, and I saw the need as well. I mean, there's a need here in commerce. Uh, there's a lot of children that need the bilingual teachers. Uh, we don't have any. There's many here in Texas A&M here getting prepared, but either they're going to other places uh, where they pay more, but we need them here as well. So here I am. <laughs> Money is not an option for me or a problem. It's not my priority, so I'm going to do one. Um, uh, Maria. Uh, Heads up, uh, what we call uh, the, pl the Commerce Plaza Comunitaria, and it, that is a, a collaboration between the University Commerce ISD and the Mexican Consulate. And there's plazas in many different communities in the United States. What you kind of do is you work with the consulate and you get approved. Uh, and um, the plaza here it serves Spanish-speaking adults. They can be from any country. They don't have to be Mexican. Um, and they give them uh, uh, basic literacy skills, uh, uh, GED. Uh, we've had quite a few uh, get their GEDs in, in Spanish. Uh, and are now they're very eager to go to college. They, it's open doors for them. And ESL, of course. And um, our, uh, my own involvement was to try and get some of my undergraduate students to volunteer over there to help them out. Uh, but they have, uh, it's all volunteer run with uh, support from the local school district. And I think it's a very useful service, not just to Commerce, but the whole city and Greenville yes. and Sulphur Springs, and that they can come from anywhere in this region as long as they want to get the car and drive. Right, yes. Um, okay, Liz. Um, I got a job um, in junior college to go mentor middle school. Uh, the principal saw that I was of uh, Latin origin, so he's like, I need you to help all the newcomers. I had no idea what the word newcomer meant. <laughs> I said, okay, whatever, I'll get paid, why not? Uh, so I went, and I walked into a math classroom, and I told the teacher, hi, here, I help the newcomers. Uh, and he goes, oh, he's over there, go sit next to him. And I went and sat next to the student, and uh, myself and you know I was like do you need help and he's like no and I remember the teacher started and he he, will, he was lecturing and I could see that the child I was supposed to be there to tutor just wasn't getting it and I remember specifically the teacher coming right up to his desk and he's, and he's older he's like you understand what I'm saying right <laughs> and the, the, the student goes he goes good we're good and he kept going <laughs> I remember going home that night upset and crying and just, ah, oh, he didn't understand anything. He went to the library later and he's telling me in Spanish, he didn't understand. I, at this time, I wasn't a fluent Spanish speaker, so I was kind of getting by with my Spanglish and we were getting through it. Um, but guess, math is universal, so it was, we, we got it and he was able to hook on. And, but I was so upset that this teacher just, good, you're good, and he's a teacher. Um, I was telling my mom about it, and she shook my hand, and she's like, you've now become an advocate for bilingual ed. Now go get your degree. And teach. So, really? That's how I oh, wow, well, that's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> your mom made you do it. My mom made you do a lot of things. <laughs>
first get them, when I first talk to them, I'll say, did you know that you have the most bank in, in your mind? And they're, you know, they just look at me and I said, because you know two words for one thing. And um, when I uh, had the opportunity to uh, help at least 15 uh, children, uh, in the beginning, they were very shy uh, by, the, by the end of the year. They were already asking questions. And these children were very shy in their own general classroom. But because I kept saying, you don't have nothing to be ashamed of. If you don't understand something, raise your hand, ask the teacher, do something. Come and look for me, find me, you know, and all this. And even the parents now, since I don't have a classroom right now, they do bring them in the night. They bring them at 6 o'clock. And uh, I help them. And they do their homework. I, sometimes I get the tutors from the university that come by and we pair them up one to one. And, and so that's my joy. My joy is that they're able to connect and that they're able to succeed. Victoria, you know, okay, um, I guess one of the greatest joys for me um, is I always felt that my classroom was like a family, you know, community, and having the parents be part of the classroom. I always felt like whenever they were on my side, we could, so many things would happen.
you know, there's you no know, the cultural, there's right. there no cultural uh, integration cultural context. context on the on the material. So. Okay. It's a great challenge yeah. for you. It's not easy to do. Uh -huh. To find materials in Spanish, and we don't have enough outdoor the Spanish to say about the experience and to share with the youngest. Uh, we don't have many of them. It's difficult to find them. We have to translate everything from English to, from English to Spanish. It takes a while. Yeah, it takes a lot. It takes me probably twice as long to translate something from English to Spanish than to write it in Spanish in the first place, right? Yeah. You know that? teaching in the poorest school district in Texas, Edgewood on the west side of uh, San Antonio. And 100% um, of my kids were minority, mostly Hispanic, a few black students. And none of them could read, write, or do math when they got to me in fifth grade. Um, and I'm proud to say that every single one of those kids passed every single one of the, the tests at the end of the year. Never did a single hour of test prep stuff. I had no worksheets or any of that. I just taught them to read, write, and do math. And I really think that uh, that's part of the biggest problem with our accountability is the teachers and, and administrators uh, freak out. And um, they think, well, we have to, you know, just focus on preparing for the test instead of building the foundational skills, the thinking skills, the reading and writing and math skills that they need in order, you know, if you just will teach them what they need to learn, uh, Typically, they will do well. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I was waiting for someone to talk about that thing. <laughs> it's the number one issue, and I'm sure Liz has a few. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Go on to Maria and then Liz. Maria may have um, as well. Well, one of the greatest challenges that I see in education uh, in, in this community, and I'm mm -hmm. sure that abroad, is that um, this, the assessment. You know, they speak Spanish at home, but they don't have, like you said, the academic language. And so when they're in school, uh, because they don't know the, some of the academic language, uh, the teachers will suggest that they take it in Spanish. Well, how can the child take an assessment in, in Spanish when they have never been in a classroom in Spanish to begin with? And uh, so then they, they take it and they do very poorly. On the other hand, they do the English one, uh, but they're not there yet because there's words there that they've never connected with the English and the Spanish. So therefore, they don't know. Um, and it's not a lack of cognitive uh, that they, they're lacking, but it's more of the uh, exposure to the vocabulary, exposure to the context, exposure to the syntax, exposure 
began at one time, but there's this other, you know what I mean, this beginning where there was no foundation for it. And so the challenge um, for me as, as a uh, person who's been there uh, at the school is that in getting people to understand that it's okay for children to get a bilingual person, a bilingual uh, teacher, and begin in the beginning, the, you know, the pre-K, the kindergarten, so that if they know one word in, in Spanish, they can also learn it in English. By the time they get to third grade, then they'll know both, both languages, and it's okay. It's okay to know that. But uh, we'll see when that happens. I'm sure uh, people, the more people talk about it, the more uh, it's out there informational-wise, and uh, education is out there, uh, hopefully that we can come up to uh, that place, that we can have bilingual teachers here in Commerce as well. I've seen some progress in the four years I've been in the biz. Still a long way to go, but things are better now than they were in 76. What do you think, guys? Yeah. Liz? <laughs> uh, I think the greatest challenge for me, um, I see, is policies. U.S. policies dealing with bilingual ed, uh, immigration, education in general. Um, it's just the, the phrase to have equal education, I'm sorry, it, it doesn't exist for a lot of students not just ELO. Um, there, we have my colleagues here talking about students who don't have this academic Spanish. Well, we have, we have English speakers yes. coming in without the academic Spanish and English, and we have general ed doing the same exact struggles. There's absolutely nothing for them to translate or have a second alternative because they're just, that's it. That's all the kids came with. Uh, but policies and education just does not favor or help in general, when policies are being written and made by people who weren't teachers, by people who didn't go, didn't have, who weren't born with the same EB uh, education, um, economic disadvantages as a majority of all, 90, over 90% of our students come in, and that's including ELO, African American, um, all of them, you know, special ed, they're coming in with 90, you know, over 95% of them are, are labeled to be um, economically disadvantaged, and Policies that are being written by people who were born with silver spoons in their mouth don't understand the challenges that come with just them, these students coming in economically disadvantaged. Then you want to add on their English language learner. Then you want to add on that mom and dad aren't together. Then you want to add on their homeless. Then you want to add on when is actual equal education going to start? People with silver spoons in their mouths will send all their children to, to expensive private schools. One of my key. Uh, and I like how you, how you said that. I just read um, a book written by some of our uh, professors here at AM, and they wrote that um, in their, in, uh, in that great schools come with a unlimited access of resources. Well, you know what? I've yet to see one in the seven years I've been teaching, and yet I feel I've worked in great schools, and we do not have unlimited resources. We certainly don't. All right, well, let's give a hand for the panel. This is the first round. We'll bring it back. <laughs> a little more exploration and uh, education, hopefully, on your part. Uh, this next section, you were all given this handout that's labeled Bilingual Education Timeline, 1770 to the present. Uh, this um, few slides that we've got here, a lot of it is uh, relevant to, to what's there. So, uh, next slide, please, Helen. The beginnings. Okay. Um, our country was founded by immigrants. And I'm talking about the colonies. The American colonies were primarily British, but there were also German and French and Dutch and Swedish and, uh, you know, Italian. all these other groups were, were there from the beginning. Um, our founding fathers, including Thomas Jefferson and uh, Benjamin Rush, who, who were both uh, signers of the uh, Declaration of Independence, said we need to have uh, universities in which people study and learn in English, Spanish, French, German, all of these languages. Um, when it came time for us to fight the British for our independence, um, there were a lot of German and French, in particular, settlers in 
in the country. Uh, my own, some of my own ancestors were both uh, German and French, and in fact, the family history is that my, one of my French ancestors that first came over was uh, fought, just like Lafayette, I'm sure you've heard of him, uh, on the side of uh, the revolutionaries and then stayed. Um, so uh, the, the revolutionaries needed uh, some muscle, and so they turned to both Germany and France, and they got quite a bit of support. They helped uh, us win that war. Um, then later on, we put together uh, our Constitution in 1787-89, something along there. And at the time, there was some discussion, uh, should we maybe like make English the official language of the country? And we think that they decided not to put that in the Constitution because they wanted all of the citizens, whether they were German or French or, or English speaking, to participate in the new government, this idea of a democracy and not a, a king and all of that. Uh, next slide, Gwen. Uh, this is not so much in the timeline, but in between those, those uh, founding father years and then World War I, there's uh, over 100 years, Something that was very sad was ha ha happening to the Native Americans. Um, the basically uh, severe, uh, I mean, they killed a lot of them, right? Because we wanted their lands, we wanted their gold, we wanted their, their territories. Um, and the pattern was to move them off of the lands where there was a lot of mineral resources or uh, forestry and all of that. Moving to places like the Badlands, they call the Badlands because they're not the best territories, <laughs> and, and, and put them on reservations. And as part of that, there was a, a move to Christianize and um, civilize the Red Man. So that meant that they needed to lose their culture, they needed to lose their language. And so they took the children away from the tribes and take, put them in these reservation schools. And there are stories in our uh, in, in, in history books about situations uh, where the kids were, if they, if they said an Indian word, um, they, were, they were severely punished. Like uh, one story of a little girl who had her fingers broken because every time she used the word, they whack her on the hand or whatever. Um, they were very, uh, unfortunately, uh, they were quite successful in this. And in many tribes, they say that within the next 10, 20 years, that their languages will disappear because the only people that, that speak those languages are now in their, like, their 80s and they're fixing to die and none of, none of the young people know them. Uh, fortunately, there are some tribes that uh, have done some revitalization um, uh, and we'll see that in a minute, the first, the most successful tribe. Uh, and, uh, the Chickasaw, I know, and some of the, 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 the uh, Oklahoma tribes, there's a lot of, you know, next door to us, um, and Native American tribes. And um, it, it'd, be, it'd be a very sad thing for, the, for them, for the last speaker to die, and none of that to go on. Because as we talked about earlier, language and culture are, are very much tied. Um, next slide, 